Hey everyone, so my name is Rick Boone and I work at Uber. Uh, I'm really excited to be here at SRECON and I'm also really excited to talk to you all about uh, some of the work that we're doing on the capacity engineering team at Uber. Um, <clears throat> we're mostly going to focus on is how we're using machine learning to focus, excuse me, to forecast resource utilization across our infrastructure, uh, across all of our applications that we're running at Uber. So before I get into the, excuse me, before I get into what and the how of what we're doing, I want to talk a little bit about the why. Uh, so most of the work that we do focuses around capacity planning, uh, making it easier for all the service owners, SREs, et cetera, at Uber. And as most people in this room know, I'm sure, uh, it's sort of threading a needle. It's sort of a Goldilocks principle. You don't want to give services too few resources. You don't want them to crash. You don't want them to degrade. But you also want to ensure you don't give too many so that you're not uh, inefficient, you're not wasting resources, you're not starving other services, and also, ultimately, so that your, uh, your company is profitable. Uh, and these are critical, both of these are critical for success in the short and long term. Short term, again, if your service is crashing, you can't serve your product, you can't fulfill requests. In the long term, your company won't be viable because there's no profit coming in, your company won't exist. So th these things are really important, but they're also really hard to do at scale. And why is that? <clears throat> Excuse me. Software tends to be unpredictable at high loads uh, excuse me, software doesn't be unpredictable. It doesn't behave the same at high loads as it does at medium or low loads. And also distributed environments in which software runs is always very volatile, especially as you get to larger scales. Uh, you have thousands of services, thousands of servers. You have different environments. You have deploys thousands of times a day. There's almost no way for humans to really understand exactly what's going to happen. Um, and that, you know, engineers aren't psychics. We're here to build things. We're not really able to predict into the future, especially with all these factors I just mentioned. Uh, and even when you do find people that are really good at this, their Jedi knowledge doesn't really scale across massive uh, groups of engineers. You'll find pockets of people that do capacity planning really well. Everyone else at the company just sort of throws their hands up and doesn't really know what to do. Uh, so how can we get this right? Well, what we want to do is start moving away from planning and start moving towards predicting. Planning, by definition, is very fuzzy. It's very, uh, it's very loose. It's not repeatable. It's not very scalable. It's localized. And there's no real measure of expected result. When I say I plan to do something, and if it doesn't happen, there's, I can't predict. I can't say, oh, like there's a 30% chance I won't do that. It's just sort of a yes or no. And it's a fuzzy yes or no with that. Plans are made to be broken, whereas predictions are empirical, repeatable. They're things that are based on math, on data, on science. We can distribute a, a model, an algorithm across our company and say, use this, and you'll get this result out. Uh, they're grounded in data. And ultimately, there is an expectation of success with a prediction. And when it does fail, I know exactly to a percentage point exactly how often that will fail. So it allows teams to make the choices of how they want to scale their services with these predictions. So if you want to get to a point where you're operating with these predictions for capacity, we need to know two things. And these are the two, same two things that you really need to know for capacity planning in general. We want to move these, it's just that we want to move these to the realm of data and math and machine learning. So the two things are, one, how does a service perform under all conditions and demands? And what that really means is just like historically, how is this thing performed at all times? Uh, and the second thing is how will it perform in the future knowing how it behaved in the past? And so to do that, we build models of all of our services. And so the models that we build are built upon a simple concept, that everything that a service does within Uber is basically doing that because of something that's happening at the very top edges. So a trip is happening, a driver is coming online, a rider is coming online, someone's opening their application, et cetera. These things fan out through our infrastructure, through thousands of services, and they all affect different types of services in different ways. But ultimately, all that really matters is a trip goes online, CPU is used. At least that's what matters to us in this room. And so if we can figure out a way to correlate the trip going online with the CPU being used, we'll have this uh, ability to understand how a service behaves at all times. And so that's the initial hypothesis. This is, sort of, this is what proves it out. Uh, if you can see it, I hope you can see it. But if, uh, I'll describe it if you can't. Uh, the red there is the riders on trip. And this is, like I mentioned, uh, a larger ingress. Oh, excuse me, let me also, I missed one thing. So these ingresses are things like I mentioned, uh, trips, drivers, riders, et cetera. So the red there is a rider on trip. 
and you can see that as that goes up, the server, the CPU for a single service, which is in blue here, also goes up. When that goes down, the CPU for single service goes down. We see this across the entire ecosystem of our services for every single one. Now, each of them respond to a different ingress differently, but typically they all respond in this tightly correlated way. And you see the same thing here. Same data, different side of the coin. So this is the same data set, except now it's a scatter plot. Again, you see this up and to the right correlation, which means that when the ingress goes up, which is the x-axis, the CPU, which is the y-axis, also goes up. This is what we want to see when we want to be able to build really performant, powerful models. If we can build powerful, performant models, what we can do is uh, take out that sort of lack of knowledge, that lack of uh, understanding of what's happening to a service, the stuff that's un that we can't really scale with, uh, all the deploys that are happening, the dependencies that come online and go offline every day, all that doesn't matter if we have a model that represents how that service behaves. We, rep we replace the idea of the service and all the intangibles about it with these models that are basically just a set of numbers. And now if we just plug in this ingress into this model, we have capacity. We know what the service is going to need no matter what happens to it. So we have this idea that, OK, we have these ingresses that will uh, give us, if we plug this into a model, we'll get out expected CPU. But how do we know which one to use? At Uber, we have a few key business metrics, uh, like I mentioned earlier. Any of these affect, affect different services in different ways. So to figure out which one we want to use, we, again, use empirical mathematical methods. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, in this case, we're doing a correlation analysis. We're using experiment correlation. And you can see visually and mathematically, you can see on the right there, the completed trips is the tightest cone of data points. It has the strongest linear correlation to uh, that CPU. And you can also see the mathematically with the actual empirical analysis that the score, this completed trips ingress has a score of uh, 0.92 on a scale of negative 1 to 1. So upper, higher being more positively correlated, that's what we want. So now we have this ingress that drives most of the behavior of a service, and we also have the service's CPU. Now what do we do with this? Well, we build a model with it. We define that relationship mathematically, and this is where machine learning and statistical modeling come into place, come into play, excuse me. We use machine learning, and what we're doing right now are linear regressions, and we are basically defining, looking at this entire data set, how can we best represent this data set? So if I put in to this data set an ingress, I get out an expected CPU. And that line through the, through the center there, that red line, is basically just that. It's a representation of this entire data set. And it really represents the minimal distance between all points to that line. Um, but there's something pretty wrong here. We're doing this for capacity. Half of that line, excuse me, half of the points are above that line, which means that we've just underpredicted half of the time. We're crashing half the time. What we really want is an ability to push our prediction to the 99th percentile. So if I have a distribution of predictions for certain ingress and I get a distribution of potential CPUs, I want the 99th one out of that distribution so that I know that I will always be at the upper bound of exactly what I'm uh, predicting for that CPU uh, distribution. So that's what we do. You notice that there are now only two points that are above that prediction line. These are two observations. Which and there's roughly about 200, 220 observations on this uh, on this graph. We're at 1% uh, under prediction, so we're only unpredicting 1% of the time. We also get a uh, equation on this. You can see C, CPU equals m times ingress plus b. That m and the b are our coefficients. That's what we store into the database. Now that represents the entirety of the service. It's all we need to be able to get accurate numbers for the service's performance in the future. We also have accurate scores for this, so we know exactly how this model is or is not going to perform in the future. So I can say to a service owner, here's this model, but it might fail this percent of the time. You can make your decision based on your architecture, your service, et cetera. And this just shows the performance of that model uh, against the test set. The red on the right are the uh, predictions, and the blue dotted on the right are the actuals. You can see it tracks almost exactly with the actuals, except that it's inflated a little bit. Again, that's that P99. We inflate to the upper echelon of what the prediction could potentially be. So awesome, we have this representation of a service. But now we need to know what that service will do in the future. How do we apply this model to uh, future inputs? 
awesomely. We have a team at Uber that does exactly this. They look at our ingresses. So again, the things, the top level things like trips, uh, trips online, drivers online, completed trips, things like that. And they predict these things out with amazing accuracy. Uh, they have data going back years and we we're able to get really, really robust, phenomenal predictions for those ingresses. This is not the actual data. I, this is just a data set I made up for myself. This is not Uber's growth. Um, I couldn't show you that. But it gives you a sense of what a forecast looks like. And so that, uh, that part on the right, that's the forecasted part, the, uh, the sort of the uh, blue cone, that's the forecasted part. That's what we take in, and we put that into that model. So now we have a model that shows exactly what a service would do, given a certain input, a certain ingress, and we have a forecasted ingress for the next, let's say, three months. So I know that on June 1st, we're going to have a certain amount of uh, trips going online. Well, if I know how to translate that to CPU, I now know how much CPU that service is going to use on June 1st. And that's exactly what we do. And so you see here, uh, the top red line is the allocated CPU. That's what they claimed. The bottom green line is what they're actually using. And that blue dotted line is the prediction that we're making to them. I couldn't show you everything uh, because you'd be able to infer Uber's growth from the rest of it. Uh, but, <clears throat> excuse me. You can see here that with that blue line, we were able to capture exactly where they were going to be. Um, and we're also telling them, look, you guys are way too over allocated and you need to bring us down. Now, you could do this uh, to some degree with, uh, you know, just looking at utilization versus allocation. But this is now scalable. It's reliable. It's based on actual math. And we're actually doing this in a way that we guarantee safety. So. Historically, you'd be able to say to someone, oh, like you need to drop your allocation down, but they'd have no guarantee, and service owners are always very wary of that because they have no guarantee that what your number you're telling them is actually based in sound math and science and something that they can believe in. Uh, historically, it's just been sort of hand wavy. So now we can actually say, no, look, this is where you need to be. We know where Uber's going to go. We know how your service behaves. Uh, we built models every two weeks, so any new code releases you just made, that new change you just pushed out to use a CPU, we, we are also accounting for that. This is how your service is going to behave in the next few months. So it's all, to me, it's very magical, very awesome, and I love doing this stuff. Uh, but it's not magical in the sense that it's impossible to do. Um, this really, the main thing here is just rethinking how you look at your capacity and your resource utilization. And so it's very uh, doable uh, at home or at the office. Uh, so number one, consider what drives your services resource consumption. Um, don't just think about your services RPS, because really that's way too, uh, too intangible. It's, it's too variant for you to really rely on. That's changing based on dependencies, based on payloads, based on traffic management. That's not truly what your full service is going to need to use. Uh, there's other things involved. You want to use something that is uh, holistically going to power the entire company. And you also want to use something, ideally, that is that can be forecasted already. So most companies, their, biz, their key business metrics are already forecasted. You're going to forecast uh, feed loads or searches or products sold or widgets sold or whatever it is, you're going to forecast that. Try to tie that to your services usage. Um, and we start doing that to figure out which one is most important for that service or platform. Again, use repeatable empirical methods to truly get something that you can believe in. Gather your data uh, into data sets. Sometimes it might not be there. You might have to work a bit to get your data together, but it will pay off, uh, trust me. We've just started in the past uh, year or two truly gathering infrastructure data. Typically, data is stored for you know, more feature, uh, features and users, et cetera. We're starting to really treat infrastructure data with the same first-class citizenry that we do with this user data, and we're getting amazing things from it. Is like what we're doing here. Building models, understanding infrastructure with data science is completely changing how we're uh, managing our infrastructure. Build your models. Uh, there's a lot of things off the shelf that are available. Uh, Scikit-learn, R libraries, TensorFlow. These things are all available. You can just pick them up and start using them. Uh, and they're also usable right on your laptop. I often, I work on my laptop all the time. I just pull data sets down into my laptop. I run models against them. I try a lot of different things. Uh, and there's, um, this, is, this tends to be very build once, consume often work. So your models can sit on your laptop and you'll just consume them throughout the week, et cetera. Just store the weights when you have them. Uh, if you want other people to be able to use them. We just use Cassandra. Again, nothing super special. We just throw these in Cassandra. They're just blobs of numbers, really. This is just all numbers. It's very compact, very small data sets. 
that are produced from the models. And finally, you just apply the inputs. Uh, you don't really need, especially if you're bootstrapping, you don't really need to have you know, a super fancy presentation layer. Sometimes things like this, or you're, you're just delivering uh, capacity reports to a service owner for the next three months. Hey, you should be here, you should be there. Uh, so you can do very straightforward uh, reports on your laptop. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? I noticed one of your slides said you were using genetic algorithms to do linear regression. Yes. I haven't heard of too many people doing that. I'm wondering why you chose that method. Sure. So we were using gradient descent initially. Um, but with gradient descent, we were using batch gradient descent. So we had to go through every single observation. And so to, uh, to model a single service, it would take, it could sometimes take a minute, like it just took too long. And we knew that for the work we're doing, we're not using a million features and like a million observations. We were like, this is taking way too long. Uh, we read a paper three weeks ago. Uh, one of the engineers here, Niels, uh, we found a paper about genetic algorithms, using genetic algorithms in a hybrid mode of simplex search. So genetic algorithm localizes uh, to the, finds the potential, where, potentially where the, local, the global minima is, and then we use simplex search to find the local minima of that. And it's, it, I mean, the speed improvement was literally like four to five X. Yep. Hey, when you're, when you're doing the capacity planning, are you targeting a certain level of utilization? And if so, do you consider queuing theory where as utilization theory, or as utilization goes to 100%, time to complete also yes. reaches infinity, and yeah. how do you handle that? So we always aim for only 80% utilization. So when we give, when we produce these, this prediction here, so for instance, that blue line, we've already incorporated, we're incorporating a bump as well. Actually, no, excuse me, this is the raw uh, prediction. So we have two things. We have prediction, which is this. We also have what we call recommendations. So we take every prediction and we add, uh, we want that prediction to be at the 80% utilization. So we always add another 20, uh, excuse me, 25% on top of that. So that when we deliver it to a service owner, they have this extra, um, extra buffer in place. Uh, I noticed that when you had the correlation of ingress to CPU, it was very tightly correlated in terms of how many ingresses were coming in in your CPU load. Uh, and that obviously played a role in terms of being able to predict that 99th percentile because you knew it was going to be highly correlated when you got yep. to that range. Do you have any recommendations for data that when it's not highly correlated? You have latency spikes and no CPU usage or latency spikes or, or request per second spikes and, and no obvious ingress load or anything like that. Yeah, so we're... I don't have a great answer yet. Uh, we're still, so we run every service and we do correlation analysis on every service. What we're doing is we're sort of putting a stake in the ground saying, okay, no correlation. We're not going to use models that are above like 0 0.4, 0 0.5. And then for those that we can't model yet, we have a naive method where we just take your prior P99 and add the buffer that I just mentioned, that 20 to 35%. Uh, we add them to your prior week's P99. We just say this is your naive model until we get to a better model. So in the coming months, uh, right now we're just doing linear regression. We plan to start moving to decision trees, to neural nets, like many uh, more sophisticated methods of machine learning so that we might be able to capture these services that are not directly linearly correlated but might have other like, you know, more complex curves. Do you only focus on CPU utilization, or what about memory utilization, latency metrics, failures, anything like that? Uh, so right now, we primarily are driving with CPU. So memory, network, and disk are also something we're going to start doing in this year, especially with, uh, we want to start modeling our database platforms, and so that will definitely, that will be disk. And actually, I think disk is probably the next thing we do instead of memory. Memory is not too big of a concern for us. Okay. I just want to... In practice, is this something like the, your data science team does to analyze a given service, or are like, de like engineering teams able to do it? And for a given service, does it take like an hour to analyze, a day, a week? Uh, so uh, for the first one, so it's actually, it's interesting. We actually have a lot of uh, machine learning and data science surrounding infrastructure. It's one of the reasons I, I uh, love Uber. Um, and so it's sort of a, a cross-functional thing right now. So we're working with the data science team to help us help inform a lot of our decisions and help help us out. My team, we have sort of a data scientist, half and half, which I am. I used to be S3, then I moved into machine learning. That's where I am now. Um, and then to answer your second question, 
Uh, it takes about like 40, no, excuse me, to train one service, it takes about like, I think we're down to like four seconds now because of that, the genetic algorithm change I mentioned. But just like, is, is there a lot, um, that like, is it a lot of time for people to like, you know, like go through, like go through the analysis and figure stuff out, or is it pretty self-service? Uh, it's, so it's self-service for the service owners. For on our part, the exploratory, thank you, my time's up, but the exploratory part is very long-term. That take that take months to understand how to do the models, but once we do, it's it's quick for them. Thanks, everyone.